Agatha Christie's first full-length original stage play, The Lie, was written when she was in her mid-thirties, amidst the turmoil of the breakdown of her first marriage. The script, never published or performed, would remain undiscovered amongst her personal papers until 2014. In it, we effectively hear for the first time the voice of Mary Westmacott, the pen name under which Christie would later write a series of six semi-autobiographical novels which her daughter Rosalind described as being about love in some of its most powerful and destructive forms. The lie resonates with ideas and phraseology which he would later use in these and other works. As well as evoking the matriarchal household in which Christie was raised and her complex emotional response to events in her life at the time it was written, The Lie is a radical piece of playwriting, ahead of its time in its frank exploration of the role of women in marriage, in the home and in society. It's also notable for portraying a central relationship which most people in the 1920s would have regarded as incestuous. The action of the play takes place over the course of only one evening, and the fact that it is set, we are told, in a typical suburban drawing room and not some distant imagined country house only serves to heighten its impact. This could happen to any of us, Christie seems to be saying. see your knitting in this light, Mother. It's getting rather dark. Oh, yes, dear, I can see. Of all hours, I love this quiet twilight hour best. It seems to me, Hannah, typical of our lives, yours and mine. Quiet and peaceful, out of the track of storm and tumult. I wonder. I think I miss the young people. You and I are very happy together, Mother dear. But we do need the young life around us. Well, they'll all be home this evening. Yes, John and Nan and my little Nell. Wasn't Nan coming home yesterday? She wired to say she was spending another day with the Roystons. Who are these Roystons? <laughs> That's just what John was asking the other day. He's very particular about his wife's friends. Quite right. He's a good man and a good husband to Nan. Yes, Hannah, you don't regret... Oh, no, no, Mother. I'm not ungrateful. Don't think that. I never forget that we owe everything to John. The clothes we wear, the bread we eat, the roof that shelters us. I know you're proud, Hannah. But believe me, it's all for the best. All for the best. No, I'm not proud. Not now. There was a time when charity would have choked me. My high-spirited girl. But that's all over now, for the sake of the children. Yes, the children. I can never pay the debt I owe to John. When he took Nan for his wife, he took also her mother, her grandmother, and her little sister, and gave them a home. Well, that was seven years ago. Little Nell has grown up to be a woman now. Yes, little Nell is a woman now. Hannah... Won't you tell me what is troubling you? It's nothing, Mother. You used to come and tell me all your troubles. I suppose you think I'm too old now. I shouldn't understand. But we old folk who sit and knit so quietly see more than you think. Isn't it Nan Sir Henry Wilding that worries you? Mother, I never knew you had ah, any... Ah, yes, I know all about it. Naughty little Nan. Nothing serious, but still one never knows. And remember, Hannah, she's her father's daughter. You're strong, and Nell, young as she is, is strong too. But Nan's weak, easily dazzled, easily influenced. I know, but it was only a flirtation between them. And in future she will have no opportunity of seeing him. Sir Henry Wilding is not of our class. <gasps> The greater the danger, then. He's a romantic figure from another world to her. She'll compare him with John. She loves John. I'm convinced that John was the original motive of the flirtation. 
She wanted to rouse his jealousy. She was successful. Well, John has positively forbidden her to see him again. That will be enough. He's a strong man. Yes. He takes no half measures. But sometimes a strong man becomes a hard man. Still, if he loves her... If he loves her? He's not a demonstrative man, but his affection is very deep and true. A love not expressed is no love at all to Nan. And a man like John, upright, honourable and straight as a die, lacks one thing. Imagination. He draws a hard and fast rule and can't understand or make allowances for Nan's childish vanity. He would treat foolishness as a crime and would crush, not humour, her perversity. Well, well, it's all over now. I suppose so. You don't think... No, no. I'm fanciful this evening. You mustn't fret. Your little Nell will be back soon. Nell... You say our life is calm and peaceful. It seems so. But I remember days, calm and still, that grew calmer and stiller, till the stillness was tense and the calmness a menace. And then suddenly, without warning, the storm burst, lightning and thunder, and all the fury of tempest let loose. I believe, Hannah, all your troubles lie behind you. This household is one of the happiest families you could find anywhere. And what could disturb that happiness? Perhaps I'm fanciful. My troubles are over, but I live again in my children. My children. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. Steal, borrow or beg for their sake. If only I could see them both happily married. Tell me. What do you think of John's friend, Mr. Haywood? Oh, very much what you think. Mr. Haywood is a nice fellow and very devoted to Miss Nell. And Nell? Oh, Nell. Well, she's very young, of course. Nan married at 17. I like Jim Haywood. He's honest as the day. He's moderately well off and he'd take great care of my little girl. Ah, well, there's no hurry. But there is Hurry. Why? She's very happy here. John, I'm sure, would be loath to part with her. She's absolutely devoted to him. Yes. She's devoted to him. And he is devoted to her. I believe he's nearly as fond of her as he is of Nan. She's such a perfect companion to him. Why, look, every Saturday they play golf. It's a pity Nan doesn't play golf. And then in the evening she accompanies his songs. Nan was never good at accompanying. Why, John would be lost without Nell. You see that too. Oh, Mother, I think that's a taxi outside. Oh, who is it? I think it's Nell. In a taxi? How <laughs> wonderful. Yes, yes, it is. Oh, <laughs> what fun. Here we are, after you. Thank you so much. I can't believe that just happened. Uh, look, I, I've, I've got the bags. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited about seeing Mummy. I can't wait to tell her what we've just done. Oh, yes. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Is John home? I don't know. I can't imagine who's here. I'm starving. It'd be so nice to eat something I haven't cooked myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, Mummy, I am so glad to be back. Nell, my darling Nell. Hello, Granny, darling. Oh, darling. Wasn't it splendid? I met Mr Haywood in town, and he said he wanted to see John, so we taxied all the way down. All the way. Oh. It was simply heavenly, wasn't it? Rather. But dreadfully expensive for you. It clicked and clicked. It made me feel awfully... Awfully reckless. I expect you'll do something more reckless than drive down to Putney in a taxi before you die, Miss Reeves. <laughs> Is John back, Mummy? No, he's not come yet. That's a pity. I particularly wanted to see him. He's sure to be here before long. You must wait. Yes, we can't have you whirling back in a taxi to town. You'll be broke if you go on like that. But really, thanks awfully for bringing me down. It was frightfully generous of you. I did it to please myself, really. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that drive down. 
I never knew you were so awfully fond of driving in taxis. Well, I'm not, exactly. How quickly you change your mind. Well, you're wrong there. When I've made up my mind, I don't change. Uh, you're in England for some time, aren't you, Mr Hayward? Not for as long as I'd hoped. I've heard today that I must be back in Canada in three weeks' time. Oh. Oh, Mummy. I've had the loveliest time. Catherine is just the same as she was at school. And her flat is simply ducky. A tiny doll's house sort of place. And she lives there all alone and is trying to be a journalist. But, of course, she's not very good at it yet, so she has to do all the work of the flat herself. Isn't it plucky of her? Would you like to do that sort of thing, now? Oh, no. I wouldn't. I should hate not to have a home, a real home, with one's own people in it. Although, of course, I like just staying with Catherine. Just fancy. I did the cooking. I'm sure you made a great success of it. Well, that depends. It always turned into something, but not always what I originally meant it to be. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> but last night was the great adventure. Catherine got a telegram and had to rush off, so I spent the night alone in the flat. Oh. It was quite gruesome. My dear child, you shouldn't have done that. You should have come straight home. Anything might have happened. Well, if Catherine can do it, I don't see why I can't. Oh. Well, I think it's time for me to go up and take my nap before dinner. <laughs> Will you help me, Hannah? Come along then, Mother. Oh, Let's thank get you, you sorted. Dear. Are you all right? Yes, a bit stiff from sitting for so long. Come along. Just a little nap. Poor Granny. It must be dreadful when one's legs won't move properly. I am so glad I'm not old. Old age won't trouble you for a long time to come, Miss Nell. Tell me about Canada, your part of Canada. My part of Canada? That's rather difficult. My part of Canada is usually a part that isn't there yet. How exciting. Do explain. You see, it's my business to buy land for myself and as an agent for other people. You pick a likely spot and you buy. Then they begin to build, the land goes up, and you sell it, do you see? But how do you know the land will go up? Well, that's where your judgment comes in. You've got to be smart about that. I haven't made many mistakes so far. How awfully clever you must be. Not a bit. Oh, but you must be. Nearly as clever as John. Yes, good old John. He's one of the best. Yes, isn't he splendid? And he's simply frightfully clever and so noble and true. He's just my ideal of what a man should be, like King Arthur. King Arthur? Yes, King Arthur. <laughs> I love talking nonsense, don't you? It must be so tiring to be always sensible. I find everything such tremendous fun. <laughs> everything? Well, almost everything. Do you think me horrid for saying that? I know there's a lot of unhappiness in the world. The East End, and people who haven't got enough to eat and all that. But I can't help feeling happy. I do enjoy things so much. You see, I've got simply everything I could wish for. I'm glad. How funnily you said that. Because I didn't really mean it. I was wishing that you might not have got everything that you wanted. Oh? Why? I should hate not to be happy. I... I must be happy. I've never dreamt that I shouldn't be. Oh, uh, I say, I, I'm a brute. For heaven's sake, uh, don't look like that. Uh, of course you'll always be happy. Oh? It doesn't matter. But you set me thinking, you know. Uh, I wonder where John is. I should have thought he would have been home ages before this. I wish he'd come, don't you? No. But you were so anxious to see him. I did want to see John, but I don't. Now. Oh. I see. No, you don't see. I can't make you see. I've been trying to make you see for the last half hour, and you won't. I love you. Well... Now do you understand? And I want to take you out to Canada with me when I go. Oh. Will you come? Oh, don't. Oh, please, please don't. I, I want you so very much. I've loved you from the very first minute I saw you. No, no, I can't. It's quite impossible. I'd be so very good to you. I'd do simply everything you wanted. It's no good. I'm dreadfully sorry, but I can't. Oh, 
Why did you go and spoil everything? We were so happy. No, we weren't. Uh, at least, I wasn't. See here, I told you I didn't change once my mind's made up. It's made up about you. Someday you're coming out to Canada with me, so you may as well get used to the idea. I couldn't leave home and Mummy. I'll give you a home of your own, and your mother shall come out for as long as you like. Any more objections? I don't love you. Are you in love with someone else? Oh, no! Well, then, how do you know you won't fall in love with me? You don't dislike me, do you? No, I, I like you awfully. I've always thought you were simply ripping. Why? I suppose I'm about the first man you've ever spoken to. Yes, I think you are. Except how do you do and goodbye, that sort of thing, you know. And John, of course. Never mind John. He's a brother-in-law and out of the running, thank heaven. I wish you were one, too. Then we could keep you in the family and you wouldn't want to marry me. Oh, I am so sorry. I feel it's my fault somehow. And I can't bear to make you miserable. Oh, do forgive me. Forgive you? For being the loveliest, most perfect thing on God's earth? Nell, if you only knew how I loved you. Oh, don't! <laughs> oh, I've made you unhappy. No, it's... it's... it isn't you, it's... Oh, I don't know what it is. John, home again. And how did my favourite son-in-law find Sheffield? Yes, Mother, home again. Sheffield was... Sheffield. <laughs> Business. Where's Nell? I bought her a new piece of music. She was here just now, with Mr Haywood. Haywood? What's he doing here? He wanted to see you about something. Oh? Oh, about that land business, I suppose. What time did Nan get home yesterday? Oh, the Roystons asked her to stop on another day. Yes, I know. She wrote me that to Sheffield. I wonder what made her change her mind. Change her mind? Yes. I called in at the Roystons this afternoon, thinking we might come down together if she hadn't started, but they told me she'd left them yesterday. Yesterday? Why, then something must have happened. Something... What? Oh... What's the matter, Mother? Nothing. I... I've not felt very well today. Well, I'm sorry for that. Nan and Nell must look after you. N Nan wasn't coming home yesterday. She's... She's coming home today. Why? Who did she go to after the Roystons? I'm... N not quite sure. Not sure? You see, she wired. Just to explain. Uh, tell me, what is this business of yours with Mr Hayward? Canadian land. It's a very sound speculation. I'm advising the firm to go in for it. Oh, we'll be millionaires yet, Mother, and Nell will be run after as an heiress. She's no claim on you. None whatever. Nonsense. It's only natural I should provide for Nell. Nan's sister is my sister. John, you're too good for us. When I think of all you've done... You must never feel that you and yours are visitors here. It's your home. I was a very lonely man till you all came and made it what it is. And now I don't think there's a happier or more united family in England than we are. Who knows what a day may bring forth. I don't think we've anything to fear. John, you're a good man. May God reward you. Oh, come, come, I'm the debtor, not the creditor. Have you seen the evening paper? No. Is there anything in it? Any... any of those unending divorce cases? Divorce cases? Yes, divorce cases. I've never known, John, your opinion of divorce. It's not a very pleasing subject. Yet in the last few years it seems to have become a very vital one. If, for instance, you found your wife had been... deceiving you, would you divorce her? Yes. No matter what extenuating circumstances she might plead? 
If I understand your meaning rightly, there could be no extenuating circumstances. You make no allowances for temperament, for character. The invariable plea. With too much mawkish sentimentality in these days, we must stand or fall, we are innocent or guilty. There can be no halfway course. You dare to judge. I do. Only a coward refuses to judge. I would judge fairly and in all justice, but judge I would. I believe there is such a thing as an inherently weak moral nature, a nature clinging and affectionate that requires to be guarded by love and care, hedged round with understanding and tenderness. Else, like a silly butterfly, it flutters, unknowing and heedless, into danger. Poor weak soul. One moment of folly, it may repent in tears of blood, but you, you would cast it out into deepest darkness. We are all masters of our own lives. If we wreck them, we must pay the penalty, men and women alike. I would have an equal law for both of them. Yes, but you, you are a strong man, John. You think me a hard one? No, I think you are right. And yet, there is a higher law. A law of pity and forgiveness. Well, we seem to be getting into deep water. The truth of it all is, Mother, that you've got a bad opinion of your own sex and I've got a good one. Don't place us on a pedestal, John. We may fall off. I know one who wouldn't. One woman on whose absolute truth I'd stake my life, whose light shines bright and undimmed like a star. Who is that? Nell. Nell. She's truth itself. Truth and purity. Why, if she swore to me black was white, I'd believe her. My little girl. Yes. There's no one like her. No one. She's... She's... Just... Nell. I must... I must go. Mother will be needing me. Ah, Mr. Haywood. There you are. John's arrived back. Now you two can talk business. Do excuse me. Hey, Haywood, old chap. I didn't realise you were still here. I was waiting for you. Didn't hear your voice. Have you been in long? Yes, sometime. You'll stay to dinner, of course. No, I'm afraid I can't. I came by to tell you I'm off to Canada sooner than I expected. So if you want to get this matter settled up, I can't do anything without old Davison. It's his money. I'm... Going round to see him tonight after dinner. You couldn't possibly meet me there. Then we could get the whole thing settled. Right. What time? Well, uh, say 9.30, that do? Perfectly. There's something else I want to speak to you about. Something I want you and Mrs. Reeves to know. Yes? This afternoon, I asked Nell to marry me. No. Yes. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Well, that's what she said. I didn't expect you to repeat it. She's too young. A mere child. I can't hear of it. What's the objection? You must have seen it coming. Little Nell? Why, we couldn't possibly do without her. She makes all the sunshine in the house. I guess I know that as well as you. But there's no real home for her here. She should be mistress of her own house, not a superfluous woman. Look at it from her point of view. Nell, superfluous. She's happy here, happy as the day is long. She won't wish to leave us, and we shan't let her go. See here, Greg, what have you got against me? Against you? Nothing. But she's told you herself it's impossible. That ought to be enough for anyone. Well, it isn't enough for me. I won't worry her, but I'm damned if I'll give up hope of her. Well, I'm damned if you shall marry her. What is all this commotion? Mother? Why, Mr. Haywood, what's going on? Uh, Mrs. Reeves... I want to marry Nell. And I've told him it's impossible. Why is it impossible? There. I'd do anything in the world to make Nell happy. I believe it. Have you spoken to her yet? Yes. And she won't have me. So there's an end of it. Young girls very often change their minds. They refuse on impulse and regret it afterwards. I say, Mrs. Reeves, you're a perfect brick. Can't you realise what you're saying, Mother? He wants to take her to Canada. I put her welfare first. You're splendid. I feel an awful brute. I thought it would be the other way on. You'd be against it and John would back me up. I believe I can safely trust her to you. You can. I'll simply worship her and do any mortal thing for her. 
You're forgetting one person in your calculations. Nell herself. Nell doesn't change her mind. She won't go to Canada. I'm hanged if I can understand why you're so against it. She's too young. Nan was only 17 when she married you. Well, that's a different matter altogether. Yes, of course it is. To you? It's always very different in our own case. Well, I'm sure Mrs. Gregg's a walking advertisement of the advantages of marrying early. I saw her last night, as it happens, and she still doesn't look a day more than 17. Last night? Yes, at the Carlton, having supper with... She's coming home tonight, you know. She wasn't with the Roystons, was she? Oh. No, she... Why, John, you know she left them yesterday. Of course. She was with Sir Henry Wilder, I suppose. Yes, that's the chap. Well, do you know him well? Not very well. Well, you're a very trusting husband, John. It's much the best plan, though, isn't it, Mrs. Reeves? Well, I must be off. Kind regards to your wife. And do try and change your mind about helping me to marry Nell. 9.30, then, at Davison's. 9.30 it is. Good night, old chap. Good night. John. Yes? John, it isn't... Don't think of... Don't believe. Rest assured, I shall believe nothing but the truth. Mr. Haywood? Yes, dearest one, I know. I feel so dreadful, so unhappy, as though it were all my fault, and I've hurt him. I can't bear to think of that, but I couldn't help it, could I? I feel as though I'd been playing and suddenly I'd pulled over some big thing that's fallen and is crushing me. It is a big thing, the biggest thing in all the world, Nell. But I don't want it. It's made it all different, me and him and everything. Jim Haywood is a splendid fellow. Any girl might be proud to have won his love. Well, anyway, I couldn't have gone to Canada. Why not? And leave you, Mummy. I can't keep you by my side always, dearest. I can only pray that you may marry a man worthy of your trust. But I don't love him. You like him? And you trust him? Yes, but I don't love him. Love might come. Mummy, you'd have me marry someone I don't love. Some of the happiest marriages have begun that way. No, you're not a child any longer. You're a woman. You must judge and reason like a woman. You've taken your views of life from storybooks. Pretty romances with love triumphant in the last chapter. But life is not like that. The ideal lover you dream of in all probability does not exist. Then I won't marry anyone. And let slip, perhaps, your chance of happiness? It's never more than a chance, and sometimes it comes disguised. We don't recognise it until it is too late. Mummy, do you want me to marry him? I want the best for you. I thought... Oh, I thought you would be on my side. On your side? Am I ever on any other? Do I live for anything or anyone but you? You and Nan? I know, but you seem so strange. I only want you to see clearly. Remember that in actual fact you are homeless and penniless. Mother! We are all living on charity. John's charity. John would never turn us out. That doesn't alter the fact that we're all dependent on him. But he belongs to us. He is not bound to support his wife's relations. Mother, I think you're horrid. I wouldn't be dependent on anyone else. I'd go out and earn my living, but John, John's different. Different from any other person. Nobler and better and more splendid. Oh. And I know he'd think it wrong for me to marry someone I didn't love. No. I'm going to tell you a story. The story of a woman who married the man she loved. It's my story, no. Oh, Mother. I'd love to hear it. You hardly ever speak of father. I never meant to. To you. 
but I think now the time has come when it is right you should know. Was he very splendid? He was a bad man. Oh. He was a liar. He was a cheat. And worse than a cheat, he was a coward and a bully. He was a man who could make a woman's life a hell upon earth. He made my life that. Mummy. But I loved him. He was fascinating. His bad qualities were all beneath the surface. I promised to marry him. My family did their best to stop it. They knew him better than I did. But I was young and headstrong. I wouldn't listen. I went my own way and shut my eyes to the truth. I married him. In a year's time, one year, Nell, that love was dead. I loathed him. Oh, that wasn't a storybook. That was life. Please, God, you may never know the suffering, the degradation of my married life. But for my little children, first Nan and afterwards you, I could not have borne it. Then my husband died. He left me penniless, a widow with two children. My mother had had money losses. She had no more than a pittance, but on that we tried to live. I worked as best I could to augment it, but I was not strong. Then... When Nan was 17, John came. John? And he brought us all here. Poor Mummy. Nell, I don't want you to share my fate. Love isn't everything. Marry a man you can respect and admire. Love will come. Well, what do you say? I can't. Not yet. The moment may never come again. We have our chance and we let it slip by. It doesn't come again. I believe with all my heart and soul that in every life there comes a moment, one supreme and all-powerful moment, when we hold our fate in our hands, to decide our life for good or evil. Nell, don't let your moment pass by. Mine it was my wedding morning. I saw then what I had so persistently closed my eyes to. It was not too late. I could have drawn back. But I didn't. I told myself my love was strong enough to face all risks. But it was not my love that held me to my word. It was my pride. I could not bear to admit myself in the wrong. I paid for that pride. Dearest Mummy. I see all that you have said, but something seems to say that the moment you speak of has not come to me yet. I can't marry Mr. Hayward. You must. I will not. Oh. <sighs> Granny? Oh, and what's all this? Mummy wants me to marry Mr. Hayward, and I won't. Ah, well, there's no hurry, my pet. He's a fine young fellow, but there, if he's Mr. Wrong, well, Mr. Right will come along some day. It's no use. Nothing's any use. John, I'm home. I see you are. This is splendid. Why, now you've been crying. What is it? It's nothing. Tell me at once. It's Mr. Hayward. Mummy wants me to marry him, and I don't want to. You shan't. This is your home, and you shall stay here. You have been very good to us all, John, but we are living on your charity. I can't understand you today. Now, this is your home as much as it is Nan's, and as long as I live, it shall be your home. And no one, no one, shall persuade you into marrying against your will. You're my wife's little sister, and you belong to me, and I'm not going to let you go. Mummy, you see... They're all for me, except you. Come to the piano, little sister. This will cheer you up. I brought you some music. The very latest. Play it for me. Oh, may I? Hannah, I don't understand you either. Why are you so anxious for Nell to marry? Can't you see? She thinks, she probably told Jim Hayward, that there is no one else. Well? But there is someone else. Someone else? Who? John. John? Nell is in love with John. 
Look at them both. She doesn't know it. If she marries Jim Haywood and goes away without finding out, there's a chance of happiness for her. But if she finds out, God help my little Nell. Hannah! And Nan, too. Oh, there's Nan! Nan! No, don't go, Mother. We're all in here, Nan. Uh, hello. Well, Granny? Mother? I'm rather late, aren't I? <laughs> Shan't have time to change. Oh, Nell, there's a dear. Take my coat. And... Yes, and the scarf. Ooh, how silent you all are. Is anything the matter? What should be the matter? Well, well you all look so glum. How are you, Granny, dear? Oh, very well, dearie. Have you had a nice time away? Oh, very nice. The Roysons were awfully kind, gave me no end of a good time. When you left them yesterday. Why didn't you come back yesterday, Nan? Oh, I stayed on another night with the Roystons. Oh, with the Roystons? Yes, with the Roystons. John bought me, isn't it lovely? You play it beautifully. John was so quiet over dinner, Mummy. Is anything the matter? He has a lot on his mind. Nell, be a darling. See if Granny's patience table is ready for her in the other room. Oh, um, don't trouble, dearie. I'm not in a hurry. I've put it out for you, Granny. The table and the cards are all ready. Oh, well, then I'll come. Oh, thank you, Let darling. me get the door. Stay with Granny, Nell, dear. We're all coming through in a minute. No, Nan, not you. I want to talk to you. What is it? Shut the door. Well, I really can't think what's the matter with you all. Especially you, Mother. You've been so strange, so queer all through dinner. Has anything happened today? Never mind today. It is more to the point to speak of what happened yesterday. All this fuss because I stayed on an extra day with the Roystons. Oh, if you had stayed on with the Roystons, it would have been all right. What do you mean? You you have lied to your husband. There is no need to lie to me. Last night, you were not with the Roystons. You were seen at the Carlton having supper with Sir Henry Wilding. Nan, what possessed you to do such a thing? I don't know. You know what kind of man John is. If he forbids you to see Wilding, he means it. And he is accustomed to having his word looked upon as law. What business had he to order me not to see him? I'm not a child to be ordered about. And what makes it ten times worse is your having concealed it. Well, he drives me to being underhand with his sternness. I'm afraid of him. If you were really afraid of him, you would not have dared to disobey him. You don't know how angry he made me. I do not wish you to see Sir Henry again, you understand? I forbid it. Just like that. He had no doubts of my submission, my obedience. It's enough for him just to issue the command. When a man's jealousy is roused... It wasn't jealousy. If I'd have thought that. But it wasn't because he cared. He doesn't care. He never has cared. Hush, Nan. You're saying what you know isn't true. Well, perhaps he did. Once. But he doesn't now. No, it was just the master dictating orders. I'm to have no fun, no pleasure. Fun? Pleasure? Is that all you want out of life? Everyone's horrid to me. I wish I was dead. You don't love me. Nan, how dare you say that? Well, you wouldn't be so cross with me if you did. Cross with you? Nan, have you absolutely no conception of the seriousness of life? I hate life. I hate everything. Oh, Nan, for <laughs> heaven's sake, pull yourself together and let us decide what is the best thing to be done. Mother... Oh, you wouldn't tell John about me and Sir Henry having supper last night. Mother, you, you haven't told him. Nan, you don't understand. John knows. Oh? How? Mother, tell me quickly. I can't bear it. When John came home this evening, he told me he had been to the Roystons this afternoon. They explained to him that you had left them yesterday, as they presumed... To go home. And you gave me away. I did not give you away. On the contrary, I did my best to shield you. I spoke as though it were the most natural thing in the world. You should go on to other friends and return today. I let John suspect nothing. 
instinct, or perhaps a knowledge of my own daughter, led me to doubt. Well? Mr. Haywood came, on business to see John. He mentioned casually that he had seen you at the Carlton last night. Oh. I tried to turn the conversation, but John was too quick for me. He saw that something was wrong. Then he asked Mr. Hayward right out, in a casual way, of course, if you were with Sir Henry Wilding. And he asked me if I had been with the Roystons, and I said yes. Oh, Mother, why couldn't you have warned me? I tried to, but it was no use. John foiled me every time. <gasps> Mother, what am I going to do? What shall I do? Of course, you must beg John's forgiveness. He won't forgive me. Not just at first, perhaps. But in time. After all, you're his wife. Nothing can alter that. His love and trust. His love and trust. He married you because he loved you. And though his love and trust are momentarily quenched, you can win back the one and prove worthy of the other. And in time, all will come right. Supposing he won't believe me? If he does not believe in your sincere contrition now, it will be your task to prove it to him in the future. We must all try and make him see the affair as a piece of childish temper and defiance. Nothing really serious. I can't. Can't what? Tell him. No. Nah. I tell you, I can't. But he knows already. I shall tell him Mr. Haywood was mistaken in thinking he recognised me. He mistook someone else for me. Then where did you go when you left the Roystons? Remember, he knows you weren't with them. He'll find out that you stayed at the Carlton, and he won't believe your statement that you didn't have supper there. I didn't stay at the Carlton. Nan, you must speak the truth. Lies won't help you now. They never do help. After all, what you've done isn't a crime. I won't tell him the truth. I shall say I left the Roystons and went to some other friends. Or... Oh, I came back home. That would do. As an invisible spirit, I suppose. As we none of us saw you. You're being absurd. Mother, why won't you help me instead of jeering at me? I will help you to speak the truth. That's no use. Nan, it must be the truth. Don't you feel, can't you feel that you want to speak the truth? Even if John didn't know, even if only I knew the facts, I would still say, tell him. You can't build up your life on lies. When the foundation is rotten, the whole structure comes down with a crash and perhaps destroys you. I can't. I daren't. He'll find out. Find out. Find out? What more is there to find out? <laughs> Nan! He'll find out where I was. Where were you? Nan! Nan! Not with Sir Henry! Yes! Oh! Why didn't I die? Why didn't I die long ago? Mother, don't! Don't cast me off! You don't know what I've suffered today! I've been nearly mad! Mad! With grief and terror! Terror! Oh, yes! I didn't dare to come home until the last possible moment. And then all your eyes... It seemed to me everyone must know. And I was so frightened, so frightened and... And John! 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 You could betray John for that man. Oh, I know one can't compare them. There's no one like John. I've always known that. But I was flattered. Sir Henry admired me. And John didn't care. Oh, Nan. No one would believe it, I suppose, after what's happened. But I love John. I've always loved him. That's why I knew what I meant to him. Nothing. He's your husband. Yes, I suppose he's a good husband. He's kind and polite and feeds and clothes me well and doesn't beat me. Oh, a model husband. But I'm outside his life, right outside it. He goes to his business in the morning. When he comes back in the afternoon, he plays golf or tennis with Nell. In the evening, there's music with Nell. He'd sooner talk to her than to me. He never cares to be with me. He never wants me. I don't interest him. Although I'm his wife, I never dare laugh and joke with him as Nell does. And then Sir Henry came. He wanted to talk to me. He liked to be with me. I was the person to him. 
And what happened? John told me to drop him altogether. Not because he cared, not because he was jealous, but because I was his wife and he disliked having his property talked about. No, no, Nan. You're saying what isn't so. It is so. I met Sir Henry again by accident while I was with the Roystons. He suggested I do dinner in a theatre with him before I went home. I agreed. I see. Mother, you must believe. You will believe. I never meant... meant... Thank God for that. All the time, I loved John. Perhaps if I hadn't loved John, I would have been stronger. I suppose you can't understand that. Yes, I can. I'm a woman. But John won't. No man would. No. I suppose I'm a very wicked woman. I only feel a very unhappy one. If only I dared tell him, I'd go on my knees to him to forgive me, but he wouldn't. Could you expect him to easily? Say what you like, Nan. He believed in you. He believed in your honour. My honour? His honour. Yes, that's where it will hit him. Not because he cares. Not because it's torment to him to think that I love another man, but for the sake of his honour. He is right. John is a proud man and a just man. And he has lived an upright and honourable life. It is you alone who have dragged down his name. There is still a chance he may never find out. Is your whole life to be a lie? I love him. Mother, what about you? All of you, Granny and Nell. You would be turned out. You'd have no home. In any case, we must go. I've some decent feeling. I can't lie to a man and live on him at the same time. Oh, what have I done? John? I've got to go round to Davison's. I may not be back till late, so I'm taking the key. Don't let anyone sit up. Good night, John. I'll leave you two to catch up. John? Yes? Aren't you going to speak to me? Is there anything to say? Please, John. I've got to be at Davison's at 9.30. A business appointment? Yes. And therefore sacred. Nothing must interfere with business. An appointment is an appointment. And your wife is your wife. My wife? John! You must tell me. I can't bear it. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Why don't you speak? You must tell me. Just because Jim Haywood fancied he recognised me at the Carlton. Fancied? I see that you and your mother have been having a little consultation. Is this the particular line of lie you have selected? Mother only told me that you thought that you imagined... Exactly. Your mother is an extremely clever woman. She did her best to shield you this afternoon. She was unfortunate enough not to be able to warn you in time. It's true that I wasn't at the Roystons yesterday. Yes. You're wise to admit that. Oh, don't speak to me in that sarcastic tone. I can't bear it. Well, what tone do you expect me to use? What do you think I'm made of? You take Jim Haywood's word in preference to mine. Jim Haywood's word? Do you think that between Jim Haywood's word and yours there is any comparison? You lied to me when you wrote that you were staying on with the Roystons. You lied to me today when you said you had been there. You're lying to me now when you say that Jim Haywood fancied he recognised you. You're a liar through and through. John! But your lies shan't save you. Tomorrow morning I shall put the matter in the hands of my solicitors. But you can't. You can't. I've done nothing. You don't know anything. I don't know anything, but I shall make it my business to find out. John, you're cruel. Cruel. You can't do what you say. Oh, it's true, I admit it. Jim Haywood was right. But what then? It's not a criminal offence to go to a theatre and have supper with a man. That's all I did. It was foolish. Unwise of me, perhaps. But I was angry at your forbidding me to see Sir Henry again, and in a mad moment of defiance I disobeyed you. Yes, lie and lie and lie again. That's all you're good for. A mad moment of defiance, you say? Why, it was planned beforehand. You wrote to me to Sheffield two days before. It was all arranged, cut and dried, but you'd lie to me if you were dying. John, I tell you, 
It's true what I say. What did you do after supper last night? What did I, I do? Yes. I, I, I drove to an hotel. Uh, what hotel? The Carlton. <laughs> you, you had supper at the Carlton? Uh, I, I, I mean the Savoy. I always mix up those two. You're sure it was the Savoy? John. Oh, oh, let go of me. You, you. Oh, oh, please, you're hurting. Oh, no, don't, don't, John. John, you won't believe it, but one thing is true. I love you. Love me. Love me. <laughs> Listen, I am telling you the truth. You married me when I was 17. I suppose because you loved me, or at any rate you thought you loved me. I did love you. I don't think you have ever really loved anyone. But that doesn't matter now. I certainly loved you. Not very deeply or passionately at first, but I grew to love you better and better every day. And then something else happened... I began to grow afraid of you. You seemed to be very hard and stern. I, I wanted to be made much of. I wanted to be petted. And I was afraid to ask for what you didn't give me of your own free will. You made me feel foolish, shallow, superficial. I, I, I knew I wasn't clever. Still, we were happy. And then something came between us. I don't know what it was, but I felt it. You weren't interested in me anymore. You shut me out from your confidence and your thoughts. You didn't need me in your life any longer. Well, I believe if, if you were in trouble, you'd sooner go to Nell than to me. And I'm your wife. Yes. You're my wife. And I believed in you. I tried to be a good husband to you. Everything you wanted was yours for the asking. You had your own people round you. Oh, yes. You were always generous. And I loved you. I believed in you. I believed in your truth and honour as implicitly as I believe in... Nels. <laughs> in Nels? I've been faithful to you in every shade of meaning of the word. Since our marriage, there's not one day you couldn't know the history of. I would forgive you anything, but then I'd love you. Her idea about love and its obligations differ. Good night. What are you going to do? I wish you to know that in any case your family shall be provided for. Oh, you might have spared me that. None of us will take one penny of your money. Your grandmother is old and feeble. Your mother is not strong. You will be wise not to sacrifice them to your pride. John, I, I shall see you again. Tomorrow? I think not. I shall make other arrangements. John, you mustn't go like that. You must listen. You've misjudged me. But I'll give you proofs. Proofs that you're wrong in your suspicions. Oh, 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 you don't believe me. Oh, but you shall believe. You shall. My mother, she knows. She'll tell you. I know your mother to be a very clever woman. Goodbye, Nan. John! John! Nan, where's John? Has he left for Davison's? Mother, mother, you must help me. It's life or death. John won't believe me. I tried everything. He's going to his solicitors tomorrow. If I told him the truth, it would have made no difference. We must think out some way, something plausible that he'll believe. Nan, it's no good. The time has passed for that. I tell you, we must find a way. Mother, don't you see? It's life or death to me. Mother. Oh, my child. My child. But what can we say? What will convince him? Whatever I say, you must vouch for. Do you think he will believe me any more than you? No. Oh, he wouldn't believe any of us. 
Except Nell. He'd believe Nell. Nell? Yes, he'd believe anything she told him. Oh. Oh. What, what is it? You've thought of something? No, it's impossible. But you have an idea, a plan? Yes. But I can't have Nell dragged into this. It wouldn't hurt her. No. She's so young. So happy. I won't have her life overshadowed. But the idea, what was it? It, it might be possible without Nell. Nell has been staying this week with her friend, Catherine Rakes, in a flat. Last night, Catherine was called away. Nell spent the night in the flat, alone. You mean that I might have spent it with her? Yes, I was with Nell. Oh, Mother, it's a chance. We must take it now. Uh, it, it's quite simple. After I left the Carlton... I drove straight to the flat. That would be about uh, quarter past twelve. Yes, at quarter past twelve. Oh, but wait a minute. John will ask why I didn't tell him this at once. Oh, leave it alone, Nan. It will only be one more failure. Of course, I was afraid. I didn't want him to know about supper. Nan, I forbid you to do this thing. You must bear your own punishment, not seek to lay it on Nell's shoulders. What harm can it do, Nell? You don't know Nell. It's not easy for Nell to speak anything but the truth. And to lie to John would break her heart. I won't have Nell's peace of mind destroyed. What difference can it make if it's John or anyone else? It does make a difference. You don't realise, Nan, how devoted Nell is to John. She can't do it. She must. It's the only way. It's a way you can't take. And what about me? Hmm? Mother, I'm your child too. Don't you love me at all? Is Nell everything to you and I'm nothing? It's my life, Mother. It's my... Nan. <sighs> Nan, my child, my child. My whole life. Very well. Oh. She must speak to John tonight. If she waits till tomorrow, it may be too late. The time will have passed. Yes. She must speak to him tonight. <laughs> Oh. oh, mother. To Going to bed, Granny. She's on her way, aren't you, Gran? Oh, yes, indeed. It's after ten o'clock. Early to bed and early to rise. Oh, thank you, dear Nell, for keeping me company. But you, my little Nan, I've hardly seen you since you came back. No, Granny, sorry. Well, are we all coming? No, I'm not going to bed just yet. Good night, Mother dear. Ah, now don't sit up late talking together, you and Nan. Make your mother go to bed, Nan. Yes, Granny. Oh, good night, all. <sighs> Nan? Where's John? Gone out to Mr. Davison's. Nell, come and sit down here. What is it? Is anything wrong? Nan is in great trouble. Oh, dear Nan, what is it? Oh, no. Tell her, Nan. It's your affair, not mine. It isn't. John's not ill, is he? Uh, no, John's all right. He wishes to divorce Nan. To divorce her? He thinks she has... has deceived him about something. But I thought you only divorced people for running away with someone else. Oh, how can I explain? There's only one person who can help me. And that's you, Nell. Me? How can I help? By saying that I spent last night with you at Catherine's flat. But you didn't. You must say that I did. But it wouldn't be true. It doesn't matter. But I don't understand. Why do you want me to say that? Because unless John believes that, he will divorce me. Now you know. But you don't want to be divorced, do you? No! Oh, no! Now, everything depends on your saying I was with you at the flat. What difference does it make if you were with me or with the Roystons? I wasn't with the Roystons. But I don't understand. Don't try and understand, Nell. You can see one thing, that only your word will save Nan from ruin and disgrace. Is it... Is it... like things in books? Yes. I thought it was only in books. I didn't think things happened to people one knew. 
to one's own sister. It all seems so dreadful. Nell, don't hate me. Dear Nan, you will help me. What must I do? Tell John I came to Catherine's flat last night at quarter past twelve. I stayed with you there and only left you this afternoon. I asked you to say nothing of it for a reason of my own. If he asks, you'll say you think it was something about supper. He'll understand. Am I to say this to John? Yes. I can't. Why? Not to John. He... Oh, I couldn't. Mother, tell her she must. There is no question of must. Nell is a woman. She must do as she thinks best. It is in her hands. Nell, you can't know what this means to me. I love John. Love him with all my heart and soul. If he casts me off, I don't know what I shall do. Nell, if you love me, if you've ever loved me, save me. Tell him a lie. I swear, if you help me, I'll give up my life to proving my love for John. I'll be his slave for all our sakes, for John's sake. John's sake? You will? Yes. Oh. oh. You... You will be careful. You won't break down. No. It must be done tonight. Will you wait here until he comes in? Will you both go to bed, please? I'd rather wait down here alone. Very well. My child. My little, little child. I don't think I'm a child any longer. Why, now? I sat up for you. I saw a light in here and thought the servants must have forgotten to put it out, and it's you. Take off your coat and sit down. I want to talk to you. It's very late. You ought to be in bed. Never mind that. I've something I want to say to you. Have you, little girl? What is it? Something very important? But I'm not the best of company tonight, now. I know. Yes. It was so quick. You see it once. I suppose it's your sympathy that makes you understand always when anything's wrong. It's not a question of seeing. Let me take your coat and hang it up. No, you don't. But I want to. I like <laughs> waiting on you. I will. Oh, you willful woman. <laughs> there. Now sit down. Here. The way I'm ordered about in my own house. Henpecked by my wife's little sister. Ah. John? It's nothing. Well, what is the weighty matter that you want to talk to me about? Not a love affair, I hope. It's something serious. Well, love affairs are sometimes supposed to be that, by the parties concerned, you know. John, don't laugh. I never felt less like laughing in my life. My time for that has gone by. But you... You are in the heyday of youth and laughter. I don't think I shall ever laugh again. Oh, my dear little girl, is it as bad as all that? Tell me about it. No. No, it's nothing bad. It's just... Now, what is it? For God's sake, don't be unhappy. Let us have one happy person in this house. Oh, we've always been so happy here, all of us. Yes, until today. Only this afternoon I said to your mother that we were the happiest and most united family you could find. And do you know what she said in answer? That one never knew what a day might bring forth. She was right. A day. One day. And everything you believed in falls in ruins round you. John. Dear John, the day is not over yet few minutes only to run yet. What difference can they make? They might make all the difference. Nothing can make any difference now. The world and everything in it has changed today. I haven't changed, John. No. You haven't changed. God bless you. 
You're the same dear, sweet, honest little girl that... Don't. Oh, don't. You haven't told me what the trouble is yet. Oh. Jim Hayward, of course. I ought to have known it. Now, I had a few words with him again on the subject tonight. I was fool enough to lose my temper, too. I told him pretty sharply I wouldn't have him hanging around. You needn't be afraid now. If they're all against you, I'm on your side. You know that, don't you? You've been so good. So good to all of us. We can never repay you. Can there be any talk of repayment between you and me? No, that's impossible. And now there's something I want to say to you. About the future. If something happens... If what happens? I can't very well explain. Your mother will tell you what I mean. What I want to impress upon you is that whatever happens, there's not the least necessity for you to marry Hayward. I look upon you as my sister, and I'm going to settle a certain sum of money on you which will render you perfectly independent. You understand? Yes, but I can't... You can't? Why, Nell, haven't I always been a brother to you? Yes. Then don't treat me as a stranger. I love you very dearly, Nell, and I want to protect and shield you from all trouble. Oh. All my life I've been a very lonely man. I've had no brothers or sisters of my own. And there's something more still, Nell, I want to say to you. It's this. Whatever happens, you won't be against me. Against you? Never. We've been friends, and more than friends. I believe you'd be on my side always. Yes. Even against your own people. They will say I'm hard, unforgiving, but I believe you will know and understand that for me there is no other way. John, you're in trouble. In about the greatest trouble it's possible for a man to be. I know. God forbid such trouble should ever come to you. But it has come. What do you mean? I mean that I know what your trouble is. Who told you? Nan herself. I suppose you would have had to know sooner or later. We couldn't keep it from you. Nan says you wish to divorce her. Yes. John, you mustn't do that. You don't understand. You can't understand. You're only a child. I, I can't argue with you about it. I am not a child. And I know that it is impossible, impossible, that you should do this thing. So Nan has worked you up to come and beg forgiveness for her. How dare she? Send a mere child like you to plead for her. I am not a child, and I am not pleading. I can't argue the subject with you. But you can tell Nan that this last device of hers is as useless as her former ones. It will not save her. John, don't look so stern, so cruel. I have never seen you look like that before. There is and can be no question of forgiveness. Nan does not ask for forgiveness. She asks for justice. Justice? You have absolutely misjudged her. So she still sticks to that story, does she? Even to you. Has she any new fabrication? What I am telling you is the truth. My dear Nell, I don't doubt for one minute that you believe it to be so. It is not a question of belief. It is a question of knowledge. Knowledge? What do you mean by knowledge? I mean that I am not repeating any story of Nan's I am speaking of what I myself know. What can you know? Nan spent last night with me. With you? She came to Catherine's flat. But... But why didn't you tell us this when you came home today? Nan asked me to say nothing about it. There was something... Something about supper that she didn't want you to know. Oh. I see. Time did she come to the flat? At a quarter past twelve. You're very exact as to time. I happened to look at the clock. And what time did she leave you? This afternoon. I came down here and she said she would come later as she had some shopping to do. And when she did come, told us she had stayed on with the Roystons. Why not say at once she'd been with you? Well, 
Supper. She might have said she'd been with you without mentioning supper. John, don't you believe me? Of course I believe you. I can't understand Nan's attitude in all this. Why didn't she tell me later when the truth about supper was out? She was angry that you wouldn't believe her. She said she tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. Who else was in the flat? In the flat? No one. But your friend? Catherine was called away early that evening. The servants? There are no servants. Just a charwoman who comes in. Then you were quite alone there? Yes. Did anyone see Nan come in? I don't think so. Then you are the only person who can prove Nan was there? Well, yes. Nell, are you prepared to go into the witness box and swear upon your oath that Nan was at the flat with you last night? John, you're not going on with it. You haven't answered my question. Are you prepared to swear in court? Of course she was there. No, I don't believe you. You're trying to screen Nan. No. I say you are. No, I'm telling the truth. You swear it. Yes. Speak louder. Yes. Louder still. Let, let me go. <laughs> I thought so. You don't believe me. No. You believe I've lied to you? I know it. <laughs> you. <laughs> Nell, you. I trusted you above everyone. I believed in you. I believed in your absolute truth and honor as I believe in... God! John! And you're like all the rest of them. You'll lie and cheat and deceive. It's not true. It is true. Have I ever deceived you? Have I ever lied to you? Just now. Never mind just now. Before that, have I ever said a word to you that wasn't true? How can I tell? Oh, you must know. You must feel that I wouldn't, I couldn't. Don't you understand? Can't you feel that to lie to you broke my heart? That I couldn't bear it, John? There is no one in the world to me like you. No one I love as I love you. I can't bear to think... to think that I... Hold me. Kiss me. No. Oh. My no. Oh. Oh. My God. What is it? Oh, what have we done? What is it that has happened to us? Is it... love? Yes. I thought of it today as a big thing that might crush me. It has crushed us. Both. I don't feel crushed. Only very wonderfully happy. Happier than I've ever been in my life. Oh, don't, don't. I, I never knew. I, neither did I. I never dreamed of it. I never dreamed that my little Nell was... Was what? The woman I love with all my heart and soul. Uh -huh. What are we going to do? Oh, my God, what are we going to do? I don't know. I love you and you love me. Oh, why did I marry Nan? Nan? When you were there growing up, Day by day, from childhood to womanhood, you, my Nell. John, it's all so wonderful. We can't help seeing and feeling how exquisitely wonderful it is. I'm so sorry. I was a brute, a blackguard, to let you know I loved you. But you didn't know yourself till then. No, I thought you were a very dear sister, that was all. I've always known there was no one like you. I see now why it was impossible for me to even think of marrying Mr. Hayward. Damn him! How dare he want to marry you? I suppose it's very wrong of us to love each other. It's wrong of me. Nothing you say or do could be wrong. I don't care if it's right or wrong. I do love you. I loved you of my own free will. You didn't make me. Come here. Come into my arms. Oh. My darling, how can I live without you? I can't let you go. Let me go. You aren't going to send me away. We're going to go on as we've always done. Live in the house with you day after day and play the brother again? I can't do it. But then... I know. We're back again where we were at the start. We've got to see what can be done, what's to be done. It's so hard to think, to see clearly... 
There must be some way. A way out of the tangle, yes, but what's the best one? The best for... The best for us both. Yes. And for others. Others? What others? There's Nan. Nan has deceived and betrayed me. She can go. But you can't judge her now. I don't judge her. I simply don't want her. That's all. She's in the way. John. Well, what have you to say for her? Nothing. How could she? How dare she love any other man but you? Leave you for someone else. You. She told me I'd never really loved her. She was right. I've never loved anyone. Till now. But she loved you. She said so. Tomorrow I shall institute proceedings for divorce. If the case is proved, I shall be a free man. John, you can't do that. It's too... too mean, too cruel. The divorce is no question or concern of yours. It's my doing solely. John, all this will make a great scandal. Here in Putney, people will say... Let them say. Do you mind what they say? You would have minded. Once? Well, I don't now, except for your sake, but we'll leave all scandal behind us. I have enough money to live on without working for it any longer. We'll go and live somewhere else, abroad if you like, to, to any place you care to choose. No more office, no more Putney. That will be something like romance. But you didn't mean to leave the office for years to come. Oh, I know. I was keen on my work, that dull, plodding work. The same day after day. <laughs> it seems incredible to think of it now. I meant to wear the collar steadily, year after year. I never dreamed of any other life. The 8.40 train up to town every morning, the annual holiday to the seaside. I thought all that was life. How narrow and paltry it all seems now. Why did I do it? Because everyone else does. <laughs> There's a reason for you. Think of it. All around us now, a hundred. No. Thousands of men, all going through the same routine, morning and evening, day after day, year after year. The narrowness of it all. Thousands of men, and you're one of them. It's in your blood. Respectability, convention, the sober business life, you belong to it. It's your heritage. Will you ever be happy away from it? You imply I've got a suburban soul. And if you have, don't you see? It's your strength. All your strength lies there. What I've admired you for, loved you for. But my love for you... Is your weakness. Never. Your romance to me. Your life. Joy. I've never really lived until today. You've coloured the world for me. It's the dull brown earth that endures, not the gay flower that grows there. It's your strength I love. No, when I'm a free man, I'll come to you. It will be no good. I cannot marry you. You're going? Yes. Out of my life altogether? Yes. Very well, then, go. John. Say one kind word to me. Just one word to show you understand. Go, if you can. John. John, I can't. I can't live without you. I knew it. Nell, we belong to each other. Nothing can part us. But not that way. There's another. John, you said we might go to a new country. Let us go there at once. At once? What do you mean? Take me with you next week, tomorrow. Let Nan divorce you. Let the disgrace be ours, not hers. Impossible, you... Yes. Let me bear it, not Nan. If I've taken her husband from her, let me take him openly, not secretly. We're doing a far worse thing than she has done to us. Drag you down? Never. It's the only way, John. The only honest way. It's that or goodbye. You can take your choice. No. I mean it, John. Think. We can go at once, at once, out of England, to a new country together. We'll leave Putney and its dullness and its narrowness and go to a new world. A world of joy and light and colour. A world of great and wonderful happiness, John. No. You will? You will? Yes.
We'll be so happy. So wonderfully, perfectly happy. We'll never regret, never even think of the past. We'll live there, John. Live every moment of the days. Why shouldn't we? Life only comes once. Why shouldn't we hold fast to any joy that comes to us? It's ours. Why shouldn't we have it? No? John? Nan. I couldn't wait any longer. It seems ages terribly long ago since I heard John come in. John, Nell has told you? Yes. John, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive you? I meant about supper. You understand it was because of supper that I didn't want Nell to tell you the truth before. I know. But of course Nell has told you. Yes, Nell told me. I told him the truth. Oh. Then it's no good pretending any longer. No. It's no good. Now. Oh. I'm glad. I'm glad. I thought I could do it, but oh, I couldn't have gone on deceiving you. I couldn't have borne my life with you always acting a lie. John, I'm glad you know. I know you can't forgive me, but I must speak to you just this once and make you believe one thing. I've been wicked, I know. But it wasn't because I loved him. It was because I thought you didn't care. I love you so much. You'll send me away and I'll go, but all my life I shall repent, repent and think of you. I suppose, John, you're too good a man to understand a woman like me. I don't ask you to take me back. You couldn't do that. I don't ask you to understand, but if you could only say you forgave me. John does understand. A moment comes to everyone when they hold their life in their hands. Sometimes more than one life. There might be three. And you hold them all. It's our moment. Mine? Yes, yours. And mine. Well? There's only one way possible. Nan's your wife, John. Nothing can alter that. John! Love is a great thing. But there is something greater than love. Forgiveness? No, understanding. No. Don't you see? This is life. The other was only a dream. You wake from dreams, but life goes on. Life must go on, John. Do you understand? I understand. Nan, shall we try again? Together? Oh, oh, John, I promise I'll show you, I'll show you. We'll both start again, Nan. Together. Someday, who knows, happiness may come. Happiness will come, my darling. Oh, Nell. Oh, dear Nell, it's all because of you. Yes, it's because of me. Leave me here. I'll turn out the lights. I want to write a letter. Tonight? Yes. Is it so very important, then? Yes, it's important. Who is it to? To Jim Hayward. Oh, of course. Oh, good night, Nell. Dear Nell. Aren't you going to kiss Nell good night, John? I forgot. Good night, Nell. Good night, John. Someday, who knows? Happiness may come. Someday. Someday.
1928, Agatha Christie would divorce her husband, Archie, who had fallen in love with a younger woman. Two years later, she married the archaeologist, Max Mallowan, and they remained together for the rest of her life. Although the lie itself has never been staged, Agatha Christie wrote 30 plays and would go on to become the most performed female playwright of all time. In Agatha Christie's The Lie, Nan was played by Sarah Mowit. Nell was played by Chloe Newsom. John was played by Ben Nealon. Hannah was played by Alison Skilbeck. Mrs. Endicott, Granny, was played by Tina Gray. Jim Haywood was played by Mike Evans. The prologue and epilogue were read by Jonathan Kidd. The drama was adapted for radio from Agatha Christie's stage play by Martin Luton and Julius Green. The director was Julius Green. The assistant director was Martin Luton. The producer was Ian McNess, and executive producer, Ashley Byrne. The music was by Rebecca Applin. It was a Made in Manchester production for BBC Radio 4, by arrangement with the Christie Archive Trust. <laughs>